Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, we look at nukes and water. In the second half of our show, we'll talk to Scott Maloney, Vice President at Poseidon Water, about California's first large-scale desalination plant. Up first, my friend and mentor Richard Ron, senior fellow at the Cato Institute and chairman of the Institute for Global Economic Growth, joins us to talk about the past, present, and future of avoiding nuclear catastrophe. Richard, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Richard, you were born three years before the first atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. You came of age during the Cold War and were personally involved in efforts to corral loose nukes after the fall of the Soviet Union. Nuclear proliferation is much in the news again, with Congress debating President Obama's Iran Treaty. For our younger listeners who missed out on being scared to death by the Cuban Missile Crisis, I asked you on to take us back to remind us how we survived our brush with nuclear holocaust and what this might teach us about the years ahead as the Islamic world looks to join the nuclear club. When the Cold War was at its worst, how close did we really get to a nuclear exchange with Russia? Well, there was a theory called MAD, mutually mm-hmm. Assured Destruction. And the whole idea was that we would have so many nuclear warheads, and the Russians, we're talking tens of thousands mm-hmm. on both sides, that if a war started, that we would destroy each other, which was, of course, mad. And when Ronald Reagan came in, he thought mad was mad. Mm. And his idea was, we win, they lose, but without a nuclear war, Mm. which is precisely what was done. Now, when I was a kid growing up in the 50s, we had drills about uh, duck and cover. No, we had them in the 60s, too. I remember them in school. Yeah, of course, this had us all sort of scared to death. Mm. And if you looked at this, we had what's called the triad, Mm -hmm. and that was the ballistic nuclear submarines, the land-based missiles, and the uh, bombers. And the idea was the Russians couldn't get them all, and at the same time, the Russians had a a similar system, and they didn't think we could get all theirs. Mm Mm-hmm. So if something had happened, if a war had started, it would have been over very quickly. Now, the Russians were basically rational. Mm-hmm. They were not religious zealots like the Iranians. Yeah, many people say we avoided nuclear war because the Russians loved their children, too. Is this true for society that straps suicide vests on their children? I can comment on the Russians, having spent a lot of time there and having many Russian friends, they didn't want to die any more than we wanted to die. They did not envision, you know, seven to two virgins or something in Mm -hmm. the future. I'm guessing that even most of the people, oh, I know most of the people in Iran don't want to die. Mm -hmm. And I think even among the leadership, they seem to go to a fairly good extent to try to preserve their own lives. Uh, The Ayatollahs are elderly and... Mm -hmm haven't exhibited, you know, a personal suicide wish, even though they may direct others to go off and commit it. So I think you have a relatively small number of people who probably really believe that they're better off dead. But it doesn't take a large number Mm. to wreak havoc, and particularly if they have nuclear bombs. So it's a very different situation. And again, I'm not an expert on the Mideast or the various shades of the Islamic religion. Let's come back around to Russia. There are something like 15,000 nuclear warheads in the world today owned by about nine countries, and this is down from about two-thirds from their peak in the mid-1980s. What became of the 45,000 bombs that eventually got decommissioned? Well, the big ones, the kind of big bombs that Mm -hmm. would be on land-based missiles in the bombers and on the nuclear submarines, much of that was reprocessed. I'll give you an example. Ukraine used to be a major nuclear power. Mm -hmm. It had many land-based missiles. So an agreement was made that Ukraine would become a non-nuclear state. And what was done is their missiles and their warheads were actually shipped to Russia under the auspices of the U.S. Air Force, hmm. we paid we paid Ukraine 
to get rid of their missiles. We paid them uh, many billions of dollars. Ukraine was desperate for the money. Sure. And we want to uh, reduce the the chances of accidental war. So this was taken to Russia. At that point, Russia was pretty much flat on its back, too. We also paid them, and the missiles were actually crushed, again, under the watchful eye of U.S. Air Force personnel, and the warheads were reprocessed into fuel for nuclear power plants in Russia. And what became of the smaller battlefield nukes? I understand you were involved in tracking some of those down. Well, I wasn't directly involved. I was primarily involved in trying to find non-weapons technologies. We had a company to search out for Mm -hmm. what technologies the Russians might want to sell or could be useful to the West. The weapons was done really under the auspices of the Department of Defense under the Nun Luger Act, Mm -hmm. and that was quite specialized. But these things sort of crossed over at times, and one became quickly aware the Russians had very poor inventory policies with all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's lots of nuclear materials that are not weapons-grade, which are used in everything from medical research to petroleum exploration and other things, but they're very dangerous. They're not going to explode like a major bomb, but they they can contaminate an area Mm -hmm. and kill a lot of people. And so it was very important to have very precise control over these. In the U.S., we do a pretty good job of this. We carefully monitor the inventories of non-weapons-grade nuclear materials. Mm -hmm. But then there was the low-level nukes. Both countries had small nuclear warheads which would fit into an artillery ship. Right, right. And these ranges, let's say, 30 miles. I've I've forgotten what the actual Mm -hmm. distances these things could be shot. But they'd be shot in a battlefield situation, and they would do things like take out a city block or things. Mm -hmm. They're not going to kill people a couple miles away. Right. Not like a big bomb. But they can wreak havoc on the battlefield. And if terrorists got these small bombs, and if they had them in a city, you know, eliminate an entire city block. Now, you'd cause quite a panic if it fell into the hands yeah. of terrorists. Yeah. Well, it would be the type of thing, particularly in densely populated areas. Yeah. It could easily have the kind of casualties we had in 9-11, the World Trade Center. You right. can imagine any major city with big office buildings mm-hmm. and so forth. A lot of people could be killed by these things. And it's something to worry about. Now, with the, the U.S. Army had most of these tactical nuclear weapons and, uh, the U.S. Army was very careful to keep track and monitor their stocks. And as they age, they have to be reprocessed. It's not so much that the nuclear material goes away, but just the guidance and triggering devices and so forth mm-hmm. corrode like any mechanical system. Now, with the Russians, there was great concern about where all these were. Mm-hmm. And I had noticed just with low levels of nuclear materials, that we'd go places and people would have left things in lockers or just behind (laughs) a rusty chain link fence with a small lock on it or someplace, not even locks. And these things, again, weren't going to explode. But the fact was there was a casual attitude about all this stuff. Yeah, We all, all Americans who were there at that time, we worried about that stuff, both leaking out and even for your own safety. You know, you're sort of wander around some of these places and you just wonder if you're getting a, a big dose of radiation mm-hmm. that you didn't intend to get. The Russians even had a even had a lake where they just dumped all kinds of nuclear waste in. Yeah. And the joke was you'd get fried if you walked around the shores of the lake. It's not something you even want to be close to. Their safety standards were far less than ours. It sounds like utter chaos. In the period, particularly in 92 and 93, when the Russian economy collapsed, the ruble almost became totally worthless. Mm-hmm. We spent time dollarizing the economy. But at that point, everything was for sale. And I remember being out at the uh, Zhukovsky airfield and where they were having a little air show, mm-hmm. and they were selling everything. And the fellow who was in charge offered to sell me Sukhoi 27s, 
for $8 million a piece as long as I had a certificate saying for museum purposes only. <laughs> and he said, oh, by the way, they'd be fully loaded. <laughs> for and, museum. Yeah, they didn't care. I mean, these were a very lethal aircraft. <laughs> Actually, the U.S. Air Force has a small wing of them for training purposes. The fact that they would sell these things, and they didn't care I mean, whether I was an American right. or an Iranian or anybody. anybody else. It made no difference to them. They just wanted the money. And Yeltsin had a period of time where he actually wanted to privatize various military facilities. Mm -hmm. And I still remember late 92, early 93, at the Radisson Slavinskaya Hotel in Moscow. And um, uh, he said, Dr. Ron, there's a Russian colonel here who would like to see you, Air Force Colonel. He's been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. I said, sure. And I met the fellow, and he spoke virtually perfect English. Good-looking, very polished man. You know, he, a type of fellow you'd like to see in our own Air Force. Mm -hmm. And very bright. And he said that he heard I had expertise in privatization. And I said, well, I, you know, I have some. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I am the privatization officer for our Air Force base because we're supposed to privatize it. Mm -hmm. And he says, I don't know how to privatize my base, and I was hoping you could give me some help. <laughs> and I said, well, what have you been doing? And he said, well, we've just been selling off stuff, things like the Russian equipment of the Jeep and <laughs> low-level arms. Hardware, you know, the, right. Yeah, and just... That was the climate. They were slowly working their way up the food chain of what they were selling off. Of course, privatizing an Air Force base is ridiculous. You can't really privatize such things. And eventually, Yeltsin began to understand that you couldn't do these things and moved away from it. But it was a problem at the time, and the fact that, you know, in that period, in the early 90s, everything was for sale. Yeah. And I always wondered of uh, what stuff we didn't catch with the Nun Luger Act. We bought up huge quantities of Russian arms, Ukrainian arms, and so forth, and made the world a whole lot safer. So, Richard, Vladimir Putin seems to be determined to recreate Peter the Great's Russian Empire. What's his strategy? Well, the strategy seems to be to nibble off pieces around Russia's current borders and be opportunistic about it. Mm. The first piece he grabbed was a part of Georgia, mm -hmm. you know, I remember, a few years ago. Yep. He looks for places he doesn't think he's going to get a great deal of resistance. Then there was, of course, Crimea, which was part of Ukraine, yep. and now taking eastern parts of Ukraine, and they keep having to seize that fire, and then a few weeks later, the Russians move a little bit further. It's all denial that it's Russian troops, but of course, we understand it is Russia. Well, Ukraine has been pushed off the front pages by the bankruptcy of Greece, but the conflict is still simmering there. Bring us up to date on, on what's happening. Well, it just continues to go on. Low level. Yeah. Slowly, the eastern part of Ukraine is now what they call an autonomous area, but mm -hmm. it's controlled by Russian sympathizers, and we know there's been a good number of Russian troops in disguise. You know, they don't wear Russian military uniforms. Right. And so they'll draw a ceasefire line, and then there'll be... Violations. Some violations, mm -hmm. and the Russians grab a little bit more. And this has just been a rather steady pattern. See, so Ukraine, when they gave up their nuclear weapons, there was the Budapest Agreement in 1994, which was signed by Ukraine, Russia, the UK, and the US, mm -hmm. which guaranteed Ukraine's borders. And that's one reason the Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons, right. because they thought they had this guarantee. Unfortunately, for the Ukrainians, there was never any discussion of how the guarantee would be enforced. It wasn't worth much, was it? No, it turned out not to be, because clearly the U.S. and the U.K. are not going to go to war or NATO over Ukraine. So as Putin grinds forward in Ukraine, there are other spots of concern. Where does Estonia fit in all this? Their, their economy's been thriving since they adopted free market reforms, but they do have a large ethnic Russian population. About a third of their population is ethnic Russian. And I was in Estonia three months ago and talked with a number of the leaders there, and they are very concerned about it. Mm. Most of the Estonian Estonians are quite anti-Russian. 
and very free market, very pro-U.S. and Europe. But what happens is the Russian portion of the population, which has never really been integrated into the economy or into the into the society, they're very still very separate. They listen to Russian radio and TV, RTV, and all the rest. Mm-hmm. So they are constantly getting Russian propaganda, and so you really have a split among the Russian population and the Estonian population. Mm-hmm. And this could be easily triggered. Anytime they want an incident. The Russians find some excuse to start an event. And then when Putin's declaration that Russia will protect Russians any place on the planet where they live, this is very worrisome to the Estonians because they have a large population of Russians. I don't think we have to worry about Brighton Beach and Brooklyn yet. (laughs) Given the Putin doctrine... He's declared almost a right to go to Brighton Beach. <laughs> well, what's President Obama's strategy been dealing with the threat of Russian expansionism? As far as I can tell, there has been no strategy. Mm. It's been things made up to go along. The president has not drawn a clear line. Clearly, he's not going to commit U.S. troops in Ukraine. Sure. But he could have made a decision earlier on to supply the Ukrainian government with more arms. There is a problem because there's so much corruption in the Ukrainian government, and right. I do have certain sympathy about that because I've been there. I mean, I know the area. And so one has to be very careful who they give the arms to, and even any aid right. Goes in pockets. has to be very carefully monitored and has to be conditional on cleaning up some of the corruption. You know, looking at the money angle, oil and gas play such a major role in the Russian economy. How long can Putin continue his aggression with oil prices down under $60 a barrel? Well, for him to break even, let's just go back a couple of numbers. Mm-hmm. The Russians a year ago made about $340 billion in oil and gas sales. Mm-hmm. Most of that was to Europe. Yeah, That accounts for about 50% of the actual Russian budget, <laughs> roughly $170 billion. That's when prices were around $100 a barrel. For the Russian budget to be balanced this year, they need oil prices 110 but they're actually about half that. So the Russians are eating through their reserves. Now, they had considerable reserves. I know a year ago they are estimated about $400 billion. Mm-hmm. I know they're down considerably from that. But Putin probably has at least a couple more years of eating through those reserves before he has to do major cutbacks in government spending, you know, for the social safety net Mm -hmm. and the other things the government spends money on. So he's got enough time probably to get through the end of the Obama administration, which I figure is his time horizon because he sees a, a weak and decisive president. And I would expect that they probably figure there's going to be somebody tougher who's elected next time. So Greece remains in the news and is likely to do so for the foreseeable future. Is there any chance that Russia could step in to fill the vacuum if Greece ultimately leaves the EU? I mean, after all, Greece fought a bloody civil war after World War II when Greek communists tried to pull the country into the Russian orbit. In theory, the Russians could step in and try to bail out the Greeks out. But again, as we noted, the Russians are less than flush with cash mm. now. And I think, again, they're smart enough to see that Greece is a never-ending hole. I mean, it was just a matter of putting <laughs> in X number of dollars, and then you get things it, right? stabilized. Yeah. But the Greeks are still a long way from the point where they have a sustainable economy. And who wants to take on a basket case? Something that will be a continuing loss. It'll be interesting to see with this new package. Now, of course, the Greeks have promised to raise more tax revenue yep. and cut spending and so forth. They never hit their tax targets. Sure. Because these are imaginary. Tax rates are already above the revenue maximizing rate. And it's just a, it's a fairy tale to think they're going to bring more tax revenue in. And because so much damage, too, has been done to the economy in recent weeks. So uh, the Greek crisis will continue on. I I can't tell how it's going to work out, but I'm quite confident it will go on and on here for a while. And eventually what will happen is Greek incomes will fall to their level 
of productivity. One way or the other, that will happen. The Greeks have already suffered nearly a 30% average loss in income, and at some point, the whole thing comes in balance, and the economy will start growing again. But they're not there yet. Richard, Ronald Reagan's strategy to bankrupt the Soviet Union through an arms race they couldn't win eventually worked mostly because communist economies just can't produce the surplus required to keep up. Switching back to the Middle East, Iran's economy is primarily powered by oil, as is Saudi Arabia as their chief rival. When they both ultimately become nuclear powers, what limiting economic principle will force them to back off? Uh, that is a very good question. I wish I had the answer for you. Mm. Again, when you're driven often by a religious ideology as much as by basic economics, things play out quite differently. Mm. With you, if I was sitting down and trying to negotiate something, I know you are a rational person. I think I'm a rational person. And we work out something which was close to win-win for us. Mm -hmm. These kind of situations are quite different because with the big drop in oil prices, and I think it's unlikely that oil prices are going to get back for sustained periods where they were because the fracking technology continues to improve. Mm. And I was talking with a friend of mine who's a major Texas oil man, and he thinks now they can, in the Texas field in southern Illinois, they can produce with the new fracking technologies at $45 a barrel and still make money. No kidding. And so the U.S. you know, has now become basically the world's largest oil producer, and we have tremendous potential to do a whole lot more. But it's also through the world. I mean, the Chinese, they're I think, the fourth largest oil producer. They probably have great potential to expand, of course, hmm. Canada. And then you've got countries which have huge potential and actually produced a lot in the past, like Venezuela, which peaked out their oil production back in 1967. <laughs> They've been going downhill all that time. And they have, I think, the world's second largest oil reserves, yeah, it's still heavy in oil. But basically, the reason their oil production is falling is just because of incompetence. Well, at some point, you would think they would have a government which would be basically competent, reprivatize the fields, and Venezuela could be a huge producer of oil and gas. So there's all this potential around the world. So it's unlikely that the prices are going to come back up to where they were and that means these countries who rely heavily on, for most of their income on oil and gas sales, Russia, Iran, Iraq, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, they're going to see a fall in their relative real income. I mean, they'll still have mm -hmm. you know, a lot of money flowing in from oil and gas sales, but we're going to see a shift in wealth out of the Middle East, basically to the Americas, and some places in Asia. So for the long run, you know, the situation for the Saudis and Iranians is not good. Now with these religious tensions, you know, between the Shia, mm -hmm. and, Shia and the Sunni, I don't know how that's all going to play out. That's well beyond my expertise. So Richard, as a nuclear club grows from nine nations to who knows where we're heading, 10, 12, 11, 13, what can we do to make the world a safer place? I think over time, as prosperity grows because of technology, hopefully it'll become safer. But the late Fred Ickley, who had been the former Deputy Secretary of Defense and back during the Reagan era in charge of arms negotiation, he wrote a book just a few years before he passed away on nuclear war. And his argument was, as we have nuclear proliferation, he thought the genie was out of the bottle, and, mm -hmm. you know, the technology is fairly well known now, and so you'll have a lot of countries having some nuclear bombs, but you're not going to have the same kind of thing we had with Russia, right. with masses of nuclear weapons on both sides to totally obliterate. His argument was that rogue nations and terrorist groups will occasionally set off a nuclear bomb. That's cheery. And that the rational country has to deal with it in the same way you would with a tsunami or an earthquake or hurricane, realizing it's an event, 
you have to, you know, clean up afterwards and hmm. do what we have to do to keep it from happening. But at the same time, we've got to be very careful not to give away our civil liberties and all the things that we've been fighting for because these things happen. And you can envision a case where a terrorist group, ISIS or someplace, could get their hands on a nuclear weapon and take out a hunk of a major American city, take out Brooklyn, and that would be horrible. And you could have, you know like Hiroshima or something, 100,000 people killed. Uh It's a ghastly thing to think of, horrible. But at the same time, one has to realize that we don't want to become a police state because of that. And, of course, we have to take proper precautions. But then we still have to get on with our lives in the same way, well, the Southeast Asian tsunami, I think 250,000 or some lives were lost in that. Hmm. Horrible thing. But, we don't give away all our freedoms because events like that happen. And so I think over the long run, the world hopefully will become more sane. As the world becomes wealthier, people who have money have things to live for. Sure. They always used to say the, the person to fear is the man who has nothing to lose. Let's work in a world where all our neighbors are prosperous so everybody has something to lose and we work in those kind of win-win situations. Richard, I hope you're right. This has been a very sobering conversation. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing your thoughts. It's a great pleasure. That was Richard Ron from the Cato Institute here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And stop by RealClearMarkets.com, my go-to place for diverse views on political economics. Real Clear Radio Hour is a not-for-profit, donor-supported program. Please stop by realclearradio.org and hit the donate button or contact us to become a corporate supporter. Ahead, we'll speak with Scott Maloney from Poseidon Water about relieving California's water shortage using large-scale desalination. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.